Welcome everyone. This is Katie at Musicians Dystonia Injury Live Talk with Martha Patterson today. I'm so excited to have you, Martha. I'm really glad that you're able to join us today. And I just want to say it means a lot that you're here because um, I wanted to uh, make something more accessible to the public over hand injuries and hand health that's accessible for musicians who are interested in learning more. So I just want to say thank you. So how are you doing today, Martha? Oh, Katie, I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm, I'm here with everyone from Southern California, and uh, even though we're used to hot, it's around 95 degrees, so I'm very glad to be with you guys in the air conditioning. Yay, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I just want to say welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Um, thank you so much, you guys, for joining and for our VSP. Um, I'll go ahead and answer any questions that you leave in the comments, and um, if I don't get to them, I will definitely email them to uh, Martha afterwards if uh, you have any questions you want me to send her. So Martha, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. I guess my first question is, I just want to kind of ask, like, how did you end up uh, getting into hand health or being uh, passionate about helping uh, artists and uh, musicians in general? Oh, wow. <clears throat> that, that question actually goes um, very far back into my childhood. <clears throat> um, I grew up in a small mountain community, and I remember one of the local conductors, he came in and, and he had had a stroke. And, um, and I just simply asked his wife why he could not conduct with the other arm. I, I had no idea. I was probably like 15 years old. <clears throat> and she said, he just can't. His brain isn't the same anymore. And that really started my life curiosity on why that is. Um, I started playing woodwinds. I started playing flute um, when I was in 10th grade. I'm not 10th grade, I'm sorry, 10 years old. <clears throat> and, um, and I went from flute to saxophone. I've also played oboe. And, and all the, just that first five years, I thought you could do anything. It was so easy for me to change instruments. So why couldn't this man change the way that, that he was conducting? And, um, and then it just, my, my path of, I wanted to do something with music but I came from a, um, a medicine background. My family was heavily um, in um, medical degrees and medical history and all that kind of thing. So I wanted to see how I could mirror both of them. Um, so I was led to occupational therapy and I also minored in music and that was very helpful. And in my very, in my senior year, my project was, uh, in, was doing a survey to all the faculty in the music department. And I just simply had one question and, and was that, were they, did they become faculty members because they were injured musicians and could no longer perform? So the naivety of any good, you know, student trying to do their due diligence and getting a question answered was very helpful. And basically all the responses came back and said, no, everybody wanted to be a faculty member. They wanted to teach. And yes, all of them had had some music related uh, injury and one was not the cause of the other. And then there was one, one survey that was turned in and there was the citation for the medical problems for performing artists a journal and it had just come out. And so I was able to get a copy of that in you know my university library and i have been studying performing arts medicine ever since cuz wow. it just it just made sense to me in the in the very first publication um i believe actually i i should remember the um musician who they were featuring i can't exactly remember in this moment but i could tell he was having problems at the piano and just by reading the article I could tell what was wrong, but because I already had the biomechanics and I understood music enough. And I just thought, why is that man not getting the care he had? So that was basically my second call to action. <clears throat> and then from that point forward, the only way I would be able to get in, get access to musicians as an occupational therapist would be going into hand therapy. So I knew I would need to study rehabilitation, study mental health, but eventually get myself into a position where I could be an outpatient orthopedic clinic. So that's where the musician would be able to get to me. Wow, that's quite the journey. Oh my goodness. But it seems like, you know, from a young age, you kind of already were guided in that direction. 
And I absolutely love that, you know, you ended up being uh, occupational therapist and helping musicians. Um, and I really think that it's valuable, uh, the knowledge that you have and the practice that you have going now. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, along your journey, uh, when you started helping uh, musicians and artists, or you started to try to be more approachable towards them, um, did you find that there were certain injuries you noticed more than others, or did you come across certain things that tend to um, cause injuries in musicians, if that makes sense? It's kind of a broad question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's fine. And, and I, I really heard the two parts to it. So if I don't answer the second part, just, just remind me. Um, um, I did start treating musicians about 35 years ago, and that was um, mostly actually consulting and injury prevention. And then probably closer to 25 years ago, I was actually able to work directly um, with them in hand rehabilitation. So I could really see maybe the effectiveness of just consultation, health consultation, and again, injury prevention from whatever we knew or whatever made sense to me in the scope of occupational therapy. But when I first started treating um, musicians, it was all in the big overall umbrella of overuse injuries. So, <clears throat> and there wasn't a lot written. I mean, I'm so grateful for, you know, um, PAMA and the Performing Arts Medical Association because they um, established the journal, um, the professional journal, Medical Problems for Performing Artists. And this was where we really could get evidence-based practice and to see what we knew and what we were doing, was it really helping? So this would include the, the broad scopes of tendonitis, um, um, lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbows, medial epicondylitis, shoulder injuries, and just kind of hand pain in general, because the, the orthopedics at the time, even in hand therapy, they were not really identifying getting in there and looking to see, oh, these are these are the interossi muscles or the intrinsics versus the intrinsics, extrinsics are out of balance. So the doctors were, were referring with just general hand pain, and we kind of had to kind of work backwards as, as detectives. Um, and some of the other injuries, even though they weren't called it, were decrevains, definitely carpal tunnel and, um, and trigger finger. Uh, those still are really the prevalent ones that I see today. And, um, and but we're, I think we're seeing more complicated injuries from musicians um, just for other reasons of kind of mind body out of balance is then triggering more compounding problems within our physiology. Um, and so there you go. What was the second part of the question? Well, the second part of the question was like more of the, I guess, uh, what are some things that tend to cause injuries in musicians? I know that uh, oh, there's use, but I think a lot of people uh, underestimate or they overlook the fact that, you know, just the fact that we use repetitive motions in general, just over and over and over and over again, play a factor into injuries. but. Um, is there, uh, how do I say this? Is there certain uh, injuries you see more than others? Oh, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would say then, um, I do see the more diffuse um, overuse injuries, more in the larger muscle groups, more up in the wrist and the finger extensors. And then we'll see a lot of um, muscle spasms down here in the, in the flexors of the wrist and also the fingers. And, and the reason that I think we see more of these, so whether it's with maybe a deep crevains or a carpal tunnel or a trigger finger, we still see all these problems. So these, these reports of pain and discomfort or dysfunction are, are along with these other clearly diagnosed conditions. And, and it is because of what you were starting to lead with. Whenever we do the, the literature review and we look at, you know, why do musicians get injured? You know, it's, it's often um, too many, too long, too awkward, too, you know, um, not enough rest. Um, the, the, um, I'm kind of scamming, skimming through it because it's more than just excessive repetitions and not taking enough breaks and being in awkward postures and not having the right um, ergonomics. We've, we've used, um, it, would, it would not be helpful just to say those are the causes because those are absolutely the con contributions. 
and how they influence the musician is what we have under our control, but we don't realize how important it is. And that is we, we um, actually, if I could just kind of break into an acronym that I have, I think it, it, will, it yeah. will bring all this together. So the acronym is FRAME, you know, FRAME. Okay, so it's F-R-A-M-E. So F is for focus versus obsession. R is for resilience and restoration, rest, regulating versus repetition. A is for action in alignment, both mental health and physical health. M is for moderation, mindset of moderation, modulating what is gonna be best for our art. And E is for education. And that education many times is what does my physiology need in order to play this instrument? You know, what does my physiology need? Because I might have something else going on in my body like diabetes. And what is the education of how can I be a top performer? How can I practice better? What are the best stretches? So in order to answer your question, it's basically everything that's opposite. So when we're obsessed, when we're rigid, when we're just doing too much for too long, and we're just super tunnel vision, that's when all the trains collide. And we just get a lot of tension in our body and everything accumulates. And, and we don't see it coming because musicians were flexible and we're adaptable and, and we've been doing this for a long period of time. But what happens is because we're more susceptible to injuries because we're using the small muscles in our hands for the most part, or we haven't conditioned the larger muscles like our postural muscles to hold us up, then when we have these anatomy trains just kind of basically run into each other because we're getting them to all fire at the same time, that's when we have these collisions. Um, but we don't see them coming. We, we just don't. Um, I know my injury, I certainly didn't see my injury coming, but I, I got injured when I, was, uh, when I was studying, when I was working as a hand therapist and then also playing flute at the same time. Um, but I was at work and I was working overtime. I was doing awkward positions, working with patients. I was picking 10 pound weights up like this. And then I had to go and sit in a very cold office and type up a report. So when I looked at it, I, I actually had all of the early, I had all of the risk factors, vibration, awkward posture, too much, too long, unaccustomed cold room and somewhere I had vibration in there, but anyway, and without any breaks. So um, that's a, it's a, it's a great question. And as you said, it is a big one. Um, and so when we can, I'm glad that this is, you know, people will be able to play this back and listen to the recording because something that we, you pick up now from today's talk is like, oh, I need that. Well, yeah, we are layers of an onion. So you need this today. And then in another two weeks, okay, now that I understand that, what, what else was that? What else is in that frame that I need to keep in my mind or keep focused in order to plug in my mind body in order to, to be the creator and be the artist I'm going to be? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And I'm so thankful that you said that and that you gave us that acronym to use. So I hope other people can find some reference in that too as well. Um, but I completely understand what you mean because sometimes um, there's so many factors to uh, being a healthy musician, but also just um, uh, taking care of our own individual needs that we, we're not aware of. So like, for example, a lot of us when we were younger, we don't know how important hydration is. Like we, we dehydrate ourselves, we drink lots of caffeine or alcohol, you know, in college or something like that. And we don't realize how in the long run it affects our muscle usage and, and, and plays into the roles of injury. So it is definitely a dynamic thing when it comes to injuries. Um, but it's so great that we have uh, health practitioners uh, like yourself that help musicians with their individual needs, especially when it comes to hands. I, I honestly don't know that much about hands, so I was really excited to learn about it today. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I feel like I don't know anything about hands. Uh, <laughs> I've read a lot of hand dystonia research and tried to apply that to amateur dystonia because there's more research on 
hand dystonia than embouchure dystonia and try to carry that over. It's helped a lot, but um, of course the hand is more complex with its bone structures and tendons and all that. And like you said, it's interesting uh, that you said a lot more goes into the uh, larger muscle groups mm -hmm. um, because I, I've had a couple interviews with uh, musicians with dystonia that talk about their dystonia tying all the way back into their elbow or their arm up here, like the ulnar nerve or something. Um, but uh, not to get off track, can we try to uh, talk a little bit about just some individual uh, injuries that uh, some people face with their hands or arms? Um, the first, and I know this is going to seem very like, you know, wow, she knows nothing. <laughs> but I guess I'm going to ask like a very basic questions that, you know, somebody who's clueless <laughs> would ask. <laughs> but um, so my first question is, can you try to describe um, what is carpal tunnel syndrome and how does that happen? I mean, again, that's not happened, but what, what's involved in it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Whenever, whenever we, we come down to a diagnosis or a new diagnosis, it's, it's really, um, you can just like go back to the body, go back to the anatomy. And the great thing is we do have Google out there right now. They've got all different kinds of imaging that we can kind of see what's going on in the body. So just starting back in the carpal tunnel, it is a small, it is a small tunnel and it's, it's almond shaped. Okay. So in it, and actually as a certified hand therapist, I should be able to rattle off how many tendons and nerves go through it. But in this moment, no, I can't. So what's so important about it is there's tendons that go through the carpal tunnel. So basically it comes down this way. And one of the tendons comes to the thumb. The others come to what bends here at these knuckles. Others come to bend at the tips. We also have um, uh, the median nerve that comes through here. What is so, so, and we also have blood supply. What is so important is there is a band, it's called transverse carpal ligament, and it's the top of that almond. So all those structures go through there, okay? Whether it's the tendons that get a lot of friction when they're going back and forth and they swell up, or if there might be some other inflammation going on in the body and that inflammation kind of gets trapped in this small space, then it's very easy for the median nerve that's right on top, that's right underneath the transverse carpal ligament to get compressed. So those are some of the internal forces that might be going on. Uh, repetition of tendons, a lot of typing, you know, just excessively without the right use to rest pace will cause that inflammation. Um, and it, cause it just doesn't have enough time to, to rest. The other thing is whenever we bend our wrists like this, we're taking that again, almond shape and it's getting compressed. So with the nerve right here on top, we're getting a lot of compression. So some of the absolute um, telltale signs, the first thing to look at with carpal tunnel is has the wrist been in this non-neutral position? So what's really good to look at, one of the first interventions is to put the wrist in neutral. And I'll talk about this in just, just a second. Um, the other thing is that in carpal tunnel, <clears throat> because there's all those structures that go through, when um, people put their wrist they rest their wrist on the edge of the desk and type like this and kind of go back and forth or go side to side. Then that almond shaped tunnel is getting compressed from the outside in. So it's really compressive forces or inflammatory forces that are affecting all those structures in that area, either directly to the nerve or around the nerve and causing that compression. And so the telltale signs, typically what the doctor will say is, tell me, tell me what your symptoms are. And the symptoms typically are numbness and tingling in these three fingers, the thumb index in the middle, sometimes half of the ring finger. And many times the pain, there's pain at night that will wake people up, but oftentimes um, that is the, um, the numbness and tingling in these three fingers. Um, you, if sometimes people have whole hand numbness and they think it's carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel might be involved in that, but that's typically something a little more proximal up here under the armpit. And then if it's over here, that that's of the ulnar nerve. So um, the other thing is that um, that median nerve comes through the carpal tunnel and it innervates the muscles over here to the thumb. So there's all different kinds of 
there's like six different ways the median nerve can go and innervate the thumb. So for those of us that have really flexible thumbs or might be, you know, <clears throat> holding on uh, load bearing instruments, and there might have a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, pressure on the side of the thumb, you can just see by here, I'm going to get a lot of wrinkling and there's going to be a lot of tension right on the other side of the carpal tunnel. So that tension could also be putting pressure and kind of backing up into the carpal tunnel. Um, it can, if you're going to ask me how it can be treated, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I was say, what are some, what are some things they can kind of do to avoid making it worse when they start having these symptoms or, or any type of relief they can get? Excellent, excellent. The first thing that all of us really need to know as functioning humans and just as musicians is to learn where neutral wrist is in for us. So looking here, my wrist is in neutral and neutral is not flat. See, this is flat and level, but in this flat and level position, there's some tension on the, on the, um, on the anatomy that's on the underside of my arm. So neutral is when I let go of my fingers. <clears throat> my fingers just basically curve and I have this arch here and I have this swoop here. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's about a 30 degree curvature. So this is neutral. There's the, the carpal tunnel has very little tension on it when it's in this position. <clears throat> so nighttime splinting, wearing a splint at night to make sure that we're not all curled up like this when we're sleeping to float the hands across the keys when we're on the computer instead of at the edge of the desk and rocking our hands back and forth or side to side. Could you imagine if the piano had, had a wrist rest? We, we, we wouldn't <laughs> really be able to get to all 88 keys, would we? But um, anyway, that's, that's a different point. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for that, yeah. Yeah, so those are, those are good. And then medicines will help. And um, nerves don't typically like ice though. So, so if you want pain relief, you could try some ice, but for the most part, if you feel worse after putting ice on something, you could be affecting one of the nerves. So, mm -hmm. oh gosh. Um, so uh, thank you so much for answering that. I know it's really broad questions that I'm asking and I know it's a lot of information to go over. Uh, but really quick, I want to say thank you to everybody's joining. Thank you, Amy Kruger online for asking some questions. She has a question here. It says, um, can the pressure of holding a French horn affect the thumb and carpal tunnel? Because we kind of hold it like our left hand like this. And for some, we have a really far way to reach the trigger. And then um, we also have a pinky hook that we use. And uh, for some horns, it's adjustable. And for some other horns, the, the thumb isn't very adjustable, but the pinky is. Um, and then depending on our hands, sometimes we have to like, we end up like playing like really flat fingered, or we have to like really uh, arch over in order to reach the keys. And mm -hmm. so it can be really a lot of tension between here and here when we're gripping the horn. Um, and then even my, my pinky's mal malformed, you can see because oh, yeah. of the it's <clears throat> deformation because of the ring for using on my French horn. But um, she said, uh, oh, she said, hi, with my question, I specifically mean in the right hand. Oh, that goes in the bell. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> affect the thumb and carpal tunnel in the bell. Oh, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so yeah, when we put our hand in the bell, we kind of do this shape and yeah, got it. hold a lot of the weight on the thumb here, right here. So. <laughs> yeah, know. absolutely. She's that, that that's yes, it can. It it absolutely it absolutely can because the power of all these muscles draw in and then by kind of doing this this shape like this, it it collapses it and makes it tighter and and brings this over here. So, yeah, it can. It absolutely it absolutely can. Um <clears throat> and one of the quick things to do just to everybody to think in general, anytime your hands might hurt, um, you know, don't ignore the pain. Don't ignore the pain. And if you can take even a brief breath break, stretch in the opposite position of what you are just doing. So if holding the hand like this in the bell, then just stretch in the opposite position. So the fingers will come out and open, the wrist will come out. And you could gently, if you know that, you know, you saw the wrinkles, then you could just gently pull your pull your, your muscles out and just hold them and just relax. 
So um, it's also about how much could it contribute? It's gonna change from one person to another, um, but you can influence the impact or how bad it gets by taking those breaks and, and stretching in between and, and just um, maybe paying an extra attention to that area and not letting it be in that position for other things, like especially because it's the right hand. Well, you wouldn't wanna hold the mouse like this. I mean, you know, you don't wanna, you know, have too small of a mouse where you're actually duplicating the tension in those muscles. So be pay a lot of attention to the non-musical muscles and non-musical, non-musical muscles. <laughs> That's not really what I wanted to say. I said, <laughs> want to say non-musical tasks because the muscles don't know the difference if they're at their, if they're at an instrument or, you know, if they're taking out the trash. So that's true. You're right. That's especially yeah. true with Estonia too, actually. <laughs> well, well, with all of them, but yeah. Um, she says, um, Amy says, for reference, I've been diagnosed with de queer veins and not no uh, OT has made any improvement. I cannot hold my horn without pain in my thumb. She says, I also have hypermobile Ehlers uh, Danielos. Yep. which affects how much I'm able to do with stretching. Oh, that's a, I'm so sorry that you have that combination, Amy. I'm sorry. Um, is there any, uh, I don't know what Dayquare queer veins is actually. So, mm -hmm. so Dayquare veins <clears throat> is another um, inflammatory diagnosis. And basically it's tenosynovitis. Here we go. It's, it's otherwise known as um, tenosynovitis. And it's when one of, there's, there's um, an extensor thumb muscle that comes right through here. It's what lifts the thumb up. And then another one takes it out to the side. So basically right here at this intersection, if you can kind of see that on me, we have different compartments in the wrist. So it's inflammatory and it's when the sheath around that tendon gets really aggravated. There's also a sensory nerve very close top very close on the top of the skin. It's like, if we had a scalpel right now, I could show you my superficial radial nerve. It's that close. So <clears throat> what happens is when there's inflammation, again, from, from the inside out, they all press together and there's compression. Specifically for Amy, it's, it's probably from the thumb was in this position and all of this would be overstretched. The other thing is when the wrist goes to the side and the extensors have to stretch over this arch here, um, that's when it's much more susceptible. So um, basically what's, I think when, when people are not finding relief from decrevains, um, I like to go back and I like to see, are they nighttime splinting? Cause we don't wanna be tucking our thumb under or sleeping like this. Um, and then also sometimes people are doing ice nerves. Nerves don't like ice. And so in this case, it, it would make it feel more stiff. So heat in this area could really help. And as Amy said, with Ehlers-Daniels syndrome, um, which is basically um, hyper, it, it presents itself, it's a genetic disorder, but it presents itself as an extreme on the spectrum of hypermobility, on the hypermobility spectrum syndrome spectrum. And, and so hypermobility means that you can just, you can move beyond the range of motion. Like you can move beyond, like you, you have such extreme flexibility, right? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so it's either from the collagen. Many times it's a, it's a, it's a disease of the um, type two. We have like five different collagen types. So it's specifically to type two. And in some people it can be type three. There's, there's a whole range of hypermobility um, syndrome disorders. And then Ehlers-Daniels syndrome is on that spectrum. So just because somebody has a really loose joint or might be double jointed and can do a party trick, um, <clears throat> doesn't mean that they will develop um, EDS. And that's what we call it, EDS, Ehlers-Daniels syndrome. Um, so it's not, um, it's not degenerative, but it's just, there's so much flexibility. So and again, joint laxity, hypermobility, those are the integrity or the, um, the, the composite materials that allow the joint to go farther. And the reason that can become problematic is because the muscles haven't been conditioned to like be the brakes or the reins to hold it back. 
So mother nature just lets this wrist drop. And sometimes I can see like 85, 90 degrees of wrist flexion. And so that's gonna be a problem here. So with Amy maybe experiencing occupational therapists that are actually make, having her maybe stretch here, doing an elbow stretch, this stretch is really good. And I, I think before we conclude today, I could show you a couple very healthy stretches and especially some technique that a lot of therapists do across the nation that I wish they didn't. And I could, I could explain why, but in Amy's saying, if she's not getting any release it from doing a stretch, it's because she's already stretched out. And so if the therapist doesn't understand the quality of tissue that's being that's underneath the decre veins, then then um, then Amy won't really get the relief that she's looking for. Um, I find in that case that um, other interventions like myofascial release, sometimes Amy, you could just talk to your therapist and say, hey, do you have another method of releasing this? I mean, it could be soft tissue release. It could be myofascial release. Um, <clears throat> or just making sure the stretch isn't a quick stretch because when we do quick stretches, other muscles will go into spasm. Um, so that, that's, those are kind of overarching, overarching things, but sometimes heating, wearing a night splint, and then just really paying attention to all the other activities in your life, Amy, to make sure that you're not going side to side with the mouse or anchoring down there or just saving this awkward position for the bell of the French horn. That's true. It is very much isolated to the horn, this position. Uh, and we have a lot of weight that we put on our right side with whether lifting the bell up or like moving it or adjusting it. It's a lot of weight <clears> on that hand. <throat> um, she says there's a mobility test they use called the Baton scale, measuring nine joints in the body. Uh huh. Uh, nine is extremely hypermobile, mobile. one is unflexible. Oh, she's just telling me the, the scale that they use or you yes. guys use. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Amy. That's awesome. I'm going to have to look into that because, yeah, I don't know anything about, I love uh, talking about range of motion tests, um, but it's, it's hard to talk about it when it comes to the jaw because we don't really have a test. Oh. <laughs> but, um, but I know you guys have a lot with the hands that you can do. And I love hand research because it carries over so much into understanding other physical maladies that we deal with in the upper body. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, not to skip around, but um, I kind of want to move into talking a little bit about uh, it. This is kind of a double sided question, too. Again, it's going to be very broad. So uh, I don't mind if you, you jump around, but um, I wanted to kind of get to, uh, first of all, like I, I talked to you in the email about how there are many musicians who have uh, hand dystonia. But they they often don't go to get help, and when they do, they're not sure who to go to, and then they try all these different uh, self uh, home remedies and trying to train themselves with like splinting and tape at home. And um, I was wondering is, if there's any advice you have for them if they're going to do self attempts or how they can benefit more from coming to someone like you who can guide them along the process and like maybe some things they can avoid that would further cause damage or something like that. I don't know if that's too broad of a question. <laughs> well, um, no, because it covers, it, it really does cover the musical experience, doesn't it? You know, every, every, everything that you said, there are things that we can do at home. And when we run into somebody who doesn't understand dystonia, a medical practitioner who doesn't understand dystonia. And if we already have some sort of rapport with them and they're like, okay, that's all I can do for you. Many times we translate that in, that's all that can be done. <clears throat> and that's not right. Yeah, I agree. And it's really, it's really awful because we often get told that we just need to kind of quit and go elsewhere. But nope. I'm so glad you're here today to talk a little bit more about <laughs> things they can actually do. <laughs> Yes. So I do. I have I have some tips. Um, let, let me start with actually the the least amount of information that I have. <clears throat> Why somebody would come to me and how they would benefit from me is I can identify what muscles are really tight in the dystonic anatomy train. OK, so because dystonia often is just task is 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 task specific and often painless. I like to go to find where all the muscle tension is. Typically in the hand, I find the extensor, the wrist or the finger extensors are co-contracting at the same time as the flexors. 
So, so coming to, um, and, and I say this coming to me, this, this is by no means an advertisement. This is <clears throat> me as an occupational therapist and certified hand therapist with a lot of years of experience that, that I have seen patients like they've already seen three, four, five other practitioners. So I learned how to do what I do based on everybody else's ways didn't work. So I'm like, something has to be done here. So, so anyway, I like to, I get the tension out of the muscles <clears throat> and then I use electrical stimulation, very specific frequency of electrical stimulation to get the muscle to learn how to fire and release fire and release. And then while the others are learning how to do their job. So we're reestablishing this, this musical muscle rhythmic choreography because the dystonia is just like splats of four notes all at the same time. It's like listening to everyone <laughs> like one big splat of a note, but we've got to really get back <clears throat> into the rhythm of that. So that's one thing I do. I make aware of where we need to stretch. There might be stretching that's aware um, or there might be releasing that has to do. We start the, we restart with the muscle um, re-education. I go right into neutral wrist. I, I, I'm treating somebody right now that he didn't know about neutral wrist. He has dystonia. He's already had a Botox shot and it was effective. And so, but he, he leads with the, 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 and he, he leads with his wrist instead of his shoulder. He didn't know that he wasn't aware of that. I bring this to his attention. I introduce the concept of neutral wrist. Then we're taping him to give the feedback of neutral wrist. And then we start looking at maintaining these arches love. We have to maintain this arch here at the metacarpals and also at the PIP joints. We can't have these joints, you know, going into hyperextension and then expect that we're going to have the right natural movement. So the therapist can help to realign the body, almost clear it, reset it, and, and moving it forward, making sure that other motions of um, above and below are not contributing to these muscles over firing. So what then we do at home, oh, there's so many things that can be done at home, but it, one really big one starts with understanding maybe what might be taking the brain and the mind into fight or flight. So we really need to regulate the parasympathetic nervous system and really bring that down, like priming the nervous system for for chill, because the thing is, is dystonia is learned so we can unlearn it. It's wonderful. And it's not going to, we're not going to deteriorate or, or degenerate. It's just going to get worse and we're not going to be able to overcome that task. So um, there's mirror imagery that can be done at home where, where you're where you're working in the mirror. I, I can explain that a little later if somebody wants to hear about that. Um, but basically practicing slower, there's something I, I've, I've been, I have the privilege of hearing from about five different medical practitioners, physicians, neurologists, um, uh, Nancy Bill, a physical therapist in, yeah, in, in the Bay Area. And she says something, I, I just have it here because I wanted to be able to get it right. And it's called, oh, I'm not exactly sure where I put it. It's called slow down. Um, it's called slow down. There it is. I found it. Um, <clears throat> it's called slow down exercise and it's five steps. Step one is pick one task. Step two is do that task at a slower speed. Pick that same speed and do it twice a day for two weeks. Two weeks later, do a little faster speed with control. Continue that twice a day for two weeks and then see if you can then do it at the normal speed or the tempo that you're looking at it to do. Again, small increments, doing it in a duration of time that you can do it with good control. So th that is very general, but when dystonia is just starting to come on or you know you can do some things that are really good, but if you go too fast, it, you, you start tripping over yourself. So the pick one task, stay focused on it, keep the nervous system primed. N no, none of this critical over voicing. Um, and we have to address the, profession, the perfectionistic 
um, voice that is coming in. <clears throat> you know, we get a chance to really, um, I, this is so hard. I wanna say be our own coach, be our own master teacher, but those can be such um, dysfunctional relationships. Um, so let me just say you wanna find a healthy, a healthy, encouraging, you've got this, it's okay to go slow because we're going to get it back. Um, and it definitely is a process. So knowing what we have, neuroplasticity is on our side. If we learned it, we can unlearn it. Um, the other thing, so I said the mirror image um, and just going slower. The other thing, oh, is biomechanics. Oh my gosh. So many of us, we don't have the right biomechanics or cannot hold them all the time. So understanding where the skeleton and the muscles might need help, maybe with posture, neck control, strengthening and conditioning those areas. So biomechanically, we can really be in a nice stacked position, address our parasympathetic nervous system so we can always be, again, in that really alignment and then practice in, in moderation. Um, but there's a lot of good literature, even mental imagery is very helpful. And th what's so wonderful, Katie, is what you said, is it is all evidence-based. And we know that mental practice is good, only practice um, the parts that aren't working real slow, the other parts that are working go back up to pace and start to learn how to modulate what is happening instead of just pushing through it and and regulating your repetitions and your speed is is what is what helps all of my patients and then um uh, thank you so much for the answer and for all the details that you gave um and i like i love that you're talking about the biomechanics in there too um i, I did an interview with david uh, like i can't never pronounce his name leishner leishner um he's a very famous classical guitarist and a professor at manhattan U manhattan university sorry my dystonia <laughs> <laughs> it affects my speech sometimes and I double I it's almost like I stutter but um okay. he he talks a lot uh he wrote a book but he talks a lot about how he he's able to retrain himself from um adjusting more to his upper body and his uh, using more of the large muscle groups to retrain in his playing with dystonia and I love that you mentioned that because um sometimes we are as musicians we're not trained about how to understand more of the larger muscle groups or even be aware of how they play into our playing or how to even become aware of them as we're just sitting and noticing how our body feels. We don't even take a general assessment of how our body feels. So it's hard to get to a place. And for many musicians, it's hard because I feel like a lot of us, we don't really start to pay attention to our bodies and, and more of the larger structures until we get injured. So I yeah. love that you brought up the biomechanics and how important that is. Um, with the with the tools that they use and everything, is there anything that they should maybe try to avoid overdoing or doing when they're using certain tools like splinting or taping? Uh, yes, <clears throat> yes, <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Most musicians, most musicians do not need to have something in their hand and just squeeze it. So just a hand squeezer or putty or a sponge overworks the flexor tendons. Those are the muscles that we're using all the time in order to play. So it's so easy to overdevelop those. And mother nature makes our flexors stronger than our extensors. So if anything, to actually work our extensors, you know, is, is, is a better ratio to work the extensors more than the flexors. The other thing is with musicians, we can just, you can just put, you know, put our hand around something and just squeeze, 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 squeeze while we're driving in the car. And um, we need any time we're exercising it for it to, for it to be mindful. Um, the other thing is, any exercise that would require the wrist to be down and then bring the wrists up. So let's say we might be holding on to a dumbbell, a dumbbell and we're picking it up like this and going to pick it up. We should stay away from isolating the wrist because the wrist is just a hinge. It doesn't have muscles in there. So there's other ways to strengthen these muscles back here. So it's not good for musicians to pick a dumbbell up or pick a bar up or something like that and then do this, we could, should strengthen everything while we are in neutral, uh, in neutral wrist, um, <clears throat> not over squeezing here. And the other thing would be going to the gym is to not be like working on pecs 
you don't want to work on anything disproportionately. So we don't want to overdo the, the compressive things like bench press or, you know, anything like that. Drummers do this all the time. Dr you know, drummers <laughs> really, they strengthen or in marching band. Oh my God, you know, drum bugle corps. You know, a lot of times they're going to the gym. So we want to strengthen our muscles in the back. We want to remember that we have triceps. We want to open the shoulders up, have good rotator cuff, um, work on forearm rotation, work on the fingers opening up. And then we have small muscles here in our hands. They're the interossi, some bend them in and out. And so even to work on those, I'm just looking for <clears throat> something um, in, we can even just put a pen here, try to keep the pen straight keep a little micro bend here, a micro bend here, make like your fingers are like scissors and just engage, just engage. These muscles are feather shaped, very, very important. So though it's a very standard question to say, what should we avoid? Um, yeah, just avoid the, the, the things I guess that are easy. Avoid that, avoid <laughs> that and avoid working the bigger muscles. It's, it's the other ones that need our attention. <clears throat> Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I agree. Um, and then uh, for a lot of people who do get injured, whether it's uh, carpal tunnel or tendonitis or um, uh, even thoracic outlet syndrome, um, mm -hmm. a lot of us when we get injured will experience swelling going on or some type of um, swelling up of fluid within us or um, just uh, swelling in general. But do you have any advice for how to reduce swelling over time or what are some steps that they can do uh, to take care of themselves at home when they start experiencing swelling or some type of pain like that? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> Not all swelling is the same, okay? So we have the swelling that comes from an acute injury when I just twisted our ankle and then it just balloons right up. And then we also get the swelling that, a comp that, that happens from compression of, of a nerve or an area. And then we have kind of this chronic inflammation. So there's a couple different ways and one is movement. So a one way to get rid of swelling is movement, pain-free movement. Let's just say it was here down in this area. We could do pain-free movement here in the thoracic outlet. So we want the joint to move because the joint's a pump. So, and if you're also doing it pain-free, then you're not getting all those signals that are going to the brain and the joint knows where you are in space and everything starts to calm down. When it comes very specifically to the hands, of course you can try ice, but you have to know what modalities work for you. So I suggest to patients to, um, so the next three things I'm gonna explain are only ever for 10 minutes, okay? So you can ice for 10 minutes, heat for 10 minutes, or do a contrast bath for 10 minutes. And my suggestion is, is for people to ice and see what results you got. And if you got good results, remember what that's like. So in the future you go, I wanna feel like that. And you go and put a hot pack. Or if that didn't help, if that didn't give you any relief, then wait about 30 minutes, again, move the area, try heat, try a hot pack for about 10 minutes. See what that relief gives you. Contrast baths are wonderful for the hands. And basically it's just um, filling up two sinks, one with hot water and one with cold water, emerging in the hot water for one minute, then jumping over to the cold for one minute, going back and forth at one minute intervals for a total of 10 minutes. It's the contrasting temperatures that get the vessels to constrict and dilate, constrict and dilate, pumping the circulation in and getting the swelling to come out. So that's really wonderful. And never, I, I have the temperatures. I think it's never less than like 60 degrees. Um, and then it's like bathtub, it's bathtub hot, but it's really those temperature variations help. And for excessive swelling to put like an eighth of a cup of Epsom salt and or apple cider vinegar. A lot of therapists and many people will say, but if you read the evidence-based practice, that doesn't work. Well, we have to think about how research is done and what money is put behind what money, what research. And I can certainly tell you in my 35 years of practice and in my body, 
I like contrast baths. And there's a lot of patients that like contrast baths. So that goes back, you know, in the frame that we were talking about is moderation. What do I need for my body? What do I need to focus on? And if we do things moderately, that, that can really help us. Um, there is taping techniques that you can wrap around fingers and you can wrap around here. There's lymphedema techniques. Um, sometimes just elevation of, of the body part will help. And then a nice light massage. You can do it with lotion, without lotion. I like massage with lotion because you, you kind of want, you want slippery and slimy. If you do it without, sometimes you can create more friction. Um, and, and then just some other um, experiences people might know, like with yoga, some yoga positions will specifically address edema. Um, if you know what, know what your medicines are, are you an Advil, a Tylenol, know what medicines work for your body, and then identify, this is the experience I'm having, I'm going to go for an Advil, this is the experience I'm having, I'm going to go for a Tylenol. Um, and then there's homeopathic remedies as well. So know what works if you, if you like the herbs and the homeopathics, it's like, it's, it's forever an exploration. Um, and then just one last thing is, it could be check what you ate last night. <laughs> if you had a really big sodium meal, you know, it was really great sushi and everything. And it was really heavy <clears throat> in that, then your kidneys are just working a little harder to process it all, but observe it. What is it like? Um, you know, can you influence it and try to connect the dots, be your own coach, be your own um, inner wisdom, and certainly your own detective. I love that you that you brought that up too with the um, with the food because for me I feel like uh, nutrition really impacts my health when I was recovering. Um, unlike uh, uh, Amy with hypermobility, I had a lot of problems with the uh, collagen in my jaw joint. So I had a, I took collagen supplements. I took uh, glucosamine <clears throat> sulfate to help boost my joint uh, support, and that helps me a lot. And then just paying attention to like not dehydrating myself because I, I was like, wow, I never drink enough water ever. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I'm so stiff all the time. <laughs> Yeah. And that's really, that's really a big deal, Katie, because there could be something going on in our gut if it's leaky gut, or if we just have an inflammatory process going on, then that's where we want to also explore that with our physicians, with acupuncture, with integrative medicines. You just continue, not necessarily till you find the right answer, because we have to remember we are trying to design what is the best mosaic for us? What is our healing tapestry? History, um, and um, and what really is effective because as we're all aging as well every 10 years we're, we're going to need something else because our body is telling us something different so and now that you've had that success and that health and healing especially from the collagen if you get inflammation moving forward it can be from a different resource I mean excuse me a different source so you need a different resource in order to address the swelling of today yeah Thank mm -hmm. you for saying that. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, but that's all amazing that you said that. I'm like kind of, now my mind's going in different places. <laughs> I think <laughs> way, way too much. I have so much on my mind all at one time. So <laughs> that's what makes you a good artist. And that makes you why you're pursuing this to, to bring us all access to the information we can use for ourselves. So um, we just, we always want for you is just um, good, healthy organization to not lose any of those. Do you imagine you're just like what the composers are like, always having melodies go through their head. They're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. More compositions, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I know that we're running out of time, but I still have a, a couple more questions if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. If, if you do need to quit at any time, you're like, I got to go. Just let me know. Um, I'm good. I'm good to be with you guys <laughs> as long as you'll have me. So <laughs> I should, I should have probably asked you before this. I was like, there's a, there's a, I'd like to at some point, and, and if, if you're up for it to do a couple of uh, interviews or videos over just separate individual things to go more into detail about them. Cause I know it's just oh, such a broad uh, subject to kind of narrow things down onto you know yeah absolutely mm -hmm. but i did want to kind of talk a little bit about um the uh, and i did bring this up in the email but i don't know if you could talk a little bit about thoracic outlet syndrome i know a couple of musicians that have problem with it that play violin and also yep. like more the instruments that pulled up here yep. or yeah or even trombone so i wasn't sure if there's any 
uh, if you could kind of explain what that is to uh, people out there who might not know what it is, and then um, we'll go into more detail. You you got it. Um, in in a in a general sense, there there is a triangular space that's basically kind of up here in our in our armpit. Okay, and all the nerves that come out of our neck all come out of our neck and pretty much go under our our clavicle. I mean, go go along in here. They come out through our armpit and then they all branch off and come down here. The thoracic outlet is that triangular space. And many times it gets smushed, it gets compressed. So the pecs could compress it or the upper traps, we could be overworking our upper traps. There's structural reasons why there would be out of balance. We could have been positioning ourselves in that way. We could have trained ourselves to be more forward and the muscles in the back are, are overstretched and weak. So many times it's it's really a postural and muscle imbalance, skeletal structural um, imbalance, and where all those nerves come together and there's pressure on it. There's also right up in here, if I were to press right in between this triangle and just kind of go down, I could really give myself a yowz. I, I think, you know, Spock, when Spock goes in and goes like that, I think it's because he's pressing down on the first rib. I'm really pretty sure of it. <laughs> So in thoracic outlet patients, we have seen elevated first ribs. And so again, this is a skeletal imbalance. And then there's um, numbness and tingling that, that comes down. It, it many times manifests itself with different numbness and tingling patterns that come down here. So again, a proximal compression that might be giving distal symptoms. So many times people are chasing, oh, we think it's carpal tunnel. We think it's uh, um, Guillain's canal. We think it's cubital tunnel. Well, but it also could be a double crush or it could be the thoracic outlet. So um, surgery is not the first thing they do. Surgery is very, very difficult in this area. So therefore, there's a lot of excellent, excellent conservative physical therapy um, pathways in order to address it. If you have to look for somebody, you would want to do your homework on that physical therapist or that physical therapy clinic, somebody that they might have in their bio that they do manual therapy, or they do myofascial release, maybe they even do cranial sacral, but you just read in that to see if they're doing any um, integrative work, or again, how do they approach, most of us kind of say this in our bios, because we want you to be comfortable coming in the door, so you want to know what they might be doing, um, and, and you, can, you can get all the muscles released, and you can strengthen them and rebalance them. Um, temporarily might have to do something different in an ergonomics realm with the instrument, you know, like maybe a different neck rest or a chin rest, you know, shoulder rest, um, um, maybe a, on a flute, an angled head, you know, so, so, so many different um, options. But again, it's really, it's really a biomechanical solution and, uh, and getting to the right, um, physical therapist because they're, that retraining and that rebalancing needs to happen. Maybe a chiropractor is in there too to release the tension and, and get, the, the, um, get the alignment or get the um, bones to be aligned. But it's the physical therapist that's going to really realign that. And that would not even be me. I'm, that's not my specialty. My specialty really is very much from here down or as it relates to posture. So of course I do treat um, thoracic outlet, um, but there are some physical therapists that, that is their specialty. Oh, wow. I know, right? Because every every injury, uh, sometimes it, it ties over into other things or other areas um, that require multiple help. Um, and I've heard of so many musicians that have had to go and um, reach out for help from multiple people. And I think that's why, you know, it's so important to treat the whole musicians because, you know, we have, there's so many, it's such a multifaceted thing when you get injured or you're experiencing something because, you know, one thing might not work or you need a certain specialist in another area and you kind of have to combine them all in order to find that, like you said, this kind of mosaic of like what helps us or doesn't help us. And it's very individualized when it comes to recovery. Um, and so I, I, my heart, I feel so much for musicians because, you know, um, it's hard to uh, find people who help us in general. And that's why I love doing this with you because I feel like the more I put faces out there that people can recognize and say, yes, 
these practitioners practitioners are approachable uh, for help um, with hand therapy or what may what it may be. Um, and so I'm just really grateful that you're able to do this interview with me today. I, I hope that it reaches other people and that they feel that it's more approachable to go to a hand therapist when they're experiencing certain problems like this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Kudos to you, madam. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. <laughs> well, kudos to you and everything you do. I mean, I wish I could go into the medical field. I am not, not um, talented in that arena. <laughs> Even though my, it's in my family, my adoptive family. It's part of long history of medical practitioners, but for me, not so much. But <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, I think before we go, I just want to mention to everybody who's watching out there that uh, Martha has some really great resources on her website. I was digging around and you have some really great um, uh, PDF files and Word documents that you can download that go over certain um, things you can do if you're experiencing some of these injuries, whether it be tendonitis or, or you know, like some type of um, uh, syndrome or, or injury. And then also you have a lot of educational tools. I, I think it's under your education tab where most of that is, but um, I'll go ahead and put her uh, information in the description section. It should already be on there um, for those who uh, RVSP to the event, but I'll go ahead and put it on there again for you guys. Um, so Martha, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. I really love this so much and I wish I could, I could speak to you for hours and hours and hours, but <laughs> I know that um, I'll just have to invite you back again to speak another time, ah. specific topics, if that's okay. Absolutely. I would love to help in, in any way at all. And Katie, if I could just take like 30 seconds to say thank you to you. <laughs> you, oh, thank you. you know you we found each other at the last at the last performing arts medical um associations uh um the annual conference and it you know you were just like wow you could help relay information and i was about you i was like wow you are doing this to get the information out there because you're helping everybody to demystify it and that's wonderful so with that I then have been kind of spun. It's been my next call to action. This is like my third call to action when it comes to performing arts medicine. The serious way is how can I get more information out to my professional colleagues? And so I'm going to be up dating my social media and, and really getting more of this educational information out there. Cause I know, I know what Google says, because when people come into my clinic, I have to spend a lot of time kind of, kind of demystifying what Google says and why that doesn't apply to them very specifically. And there's, like you said, there's so much information we have and it's all shareable. We can distill it all and, and we really can reach out reach out to each other so so honestly if there's something that you don't see i looked at my own website katie yesterday and i was like oh no it needs a booster <laughs> <laughs> so anyway and anyway and basically everybody's helping each other and so i'm going to start building on this and um and just making things more accessible and more friendly so thank you for for inspiring me to continue to give in a way I really had not reached out through, which is social media. Oh, well, if you, I, I love it. And I'm so glad I was able to do this and to also get your voice out there as well. And if you need any help with that, just let me know. For a lot of people, <laughs> I am like a social media fiend. I, I love posting videos, making videos, like doing all that kind of stuff. So if you ever need help, just dial me up. So. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Martha. Well, I will let you go. And then um, after this is ended, um, if anybody has uh, inboxed me or sent me any more questions in the comment section, I'll go ahead and email them to you. Okay. And then uh, what's going to happen after this is I'm going to go and edit this video, an introduction onto it, as well as the ending. And then I'll go ahead and uh, create it onto a YouTube. And then you'll go ahead and get that link from me. So it's more accessible on there as well. You can send it to whoever you want and it'll be nice and edited and trimmed up if I made any mistakes. So <laughs> yeah, otherwise that should be about it. <laughs> oh my God, this is just so wonderful. All right, well, Katie, to you and all of your listeners, you know, let's just find a way to be healthy, live healthy, play healthy, but keep in touch with our artistry and find that moderation and how we can just include it all because music and art is, it's, it's, it's um it's really inclusive 
And even we can even include the injury. We can include our body aches and pains. It all can coexist and it all can come forth. We don't have to be perfect in order to express. We can be who we are and find a way. The body needs us um, to do that and we can show up for it. Thank you, Martha. So well said. And thank you for all of your support um, for musicians out there. All right. I will talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye, Martha.